Today, I'm going to clarify, add context, and give concrete examples for five of the most important ideas that Ido Portal presented on the Huberman podcast about the science and practice of movement. I will try not to answer any of your questions. First, what are we talking about when we talk about a movement practice? The dictionary definition is the action or process of moving or of changing place or position. But what we really mean when we say I study movement is that we endeavor to study all the different ways that we can move rather than specific scenarios or disciplines. In an internship in 2017, Ido defined movement using five pillars, martial, acrobatic, somatic, object manipulation, and dance. Recently, I've started to find this definition more inadequate. Ido seems to agree as he's since changed his model, but I'd like to present you with a much more concrete model that I've been working on for most of this year. I made a list of all the most challenging disciplines I've studied over the years. And I asked, what is the most fundamentally important and limiting capacity in this sport, excluding the sport-specific movements themselves? I then consolidated that list until each attribute had unique aspects not fundamentally represented within any of the other axes. This leaves us with 16 fundamental axes of movement. I have some critiques of my own model, of course, but so far everyone I've given this model has found it very helpful. So we have four axes that correspond to the hardware in a computer and 12 that would correspond to the software or the operating system. The hardware axes place some limits on the theoretical capabilities of your body. You can have extremely developed hardware and be a horrible mover, and you can be a great mover with pretty terrible hardware. But if you wanna be really good or just develop yourself intelligently, Hardware development is very important. The four hardware axes are strength, how much force you can produce in various positions and ranges. How much can you squat and deadlift through a full range of motion? If I grab your head and pull on it, can your core generate the necessary forces to resist me? Are you gonna crumple to the floor like a twig? Or is it gonna feel like I'm trying to pull on a three foot thick concrete pillar like my old judo instructor? And are you strong everywhere? or only when you're set up to bench press a laser aligned 28 millimeter barbell. Note that functional expression of strength has a large neural and technical component, but for strength as a hardware axis, think of the fundamental maximum force that your muscle tissue can produce at your maximum voluntary contraction. Second is mobility. What ranges of motion and positions you can access. There's an overlap here with strength, as a lot of positions given a certain body weight will require a certain amount of force to access. A lot of you use mobility as an excuse for why you're bad at or can't do certain movements. And while that's generally not the case, if you're say a dancer with great mobility, not only can you have much greater theoretical access to a variety of movements and positions, you can also do things like just stand and lift the leg and suddenly it's beautiful and impressive. That's a great tool to have. Third, cardio, your body's ability to do work over a sustained period of time. This is mainly limited by your body's ability to deliver oxygen to the tissues. And there's some evidence that it's specific to the type of exercise you do. For complex movement tasks, cardio will rarely, if ever, be the issue. But having good cardio will allow you to accumulate more practice, make training less stressful on your body, and may aid recovery. Fourth, resilience. The loads and volumes you can handle without pain. You would think that resilience is all about having thick tendons, muscles, and dense bones. But remember, as we discussed in this video, Pain is fundamentally an output of the brain. Hence, your nervous system essentially needs to be comfortable with all the parameters of loading for you to really be resilient. Still, like strength, I think there's a value in treating resilience functionally as a hardware axis, especially as it's often far more of a bottleneck than the rest of the hardware axes. The software axes are usually far more limiting than the hardware and movement. They are one, footwork. How well your feet can organize your body and its movement through space. Ever hear someone talk about getting caught flat-footed? That means that at a critical moment, they were caught with both feet flat on the floor, unable to quickly respond. Good footwork is the polar opposite. Your feet intelligently organizing beneath you to facilitate quick and effective movement where Wherever you need to go, whenever you need to go there, or to balance, stabilize, and produce force to keep you where you need to be. Somatics, our awareness of and control over our internal environment. Somatics is arguably the most important axis of movement training, because for most of us, this is where your training really feeds back into the rest of your life. There's a certain state that's optimal to fight, and a certain state that's needed to dance with a partner. These two could be seen as different extremes within a spectrum. If you switch the two, even just for seconds, you're either going to traumatize your dance partner or your opponent is going to beat the living daylights out of you. Certain states are optimal for certain tasks. Balance, stillness, strength, reactivity, partner, and oppositional tasks all require different states. And an important focus of your somatic training is the ability to drop into the optimal state for the task and maintain it or create it 
within different environmental contexts or pressures. Maybe that means you need to learn to fully clear previous failures with every handstand attempt. Maybe you learn to find the dance even when people are watching. Maybe you learn when to push and how to actually rest or when you're just being lazy. Maybe it means you need to learn how to keep showing up for something day after day, how to set aside your ego when you're already good and hold on to your confidence when you're failing repeatedly. I honestly believe some of these things can only be deeply learned through a movement practice. Next, explosive force production. The coordination to generate large amounts of force quickly from many different vectors. Separate from the actual force your muscle tissues can create, there's a certain type of coordination necessary to generate huge amounts of force in a short time. I'm talking about shooting off the blocks in the sprint, the triple extension in a clean, rotational forces in a punch, throw, swing, or kick. The ability for this coordination seems to be a bit of its own thing. For instance, I've been completely enamored with the abilities of dancers over the last few years, and yet, Categorically, while they'll chew up new movements like I eat grains of rice, they often seem fundamentally incapable of finding this coordination. It's outside of their scope of practice. Motor digestion, the ability to see, understand, digest, then recreate movements with accuracy and speed. If you go to a beginner dance class anywhere in the world of almost any style, they aren't gonna give you two moves to learn in an hour to do it. They're gonna give you 10, 20, 30 moves or more in that same hour. And you're gonna have to process rapidly what those moves are and how to recreate them in your own body. How quickly, easily, and accurately can you do that for movement in a variety of disciplines? There's such an enormous spectrum of ability here, I shit you not, most professional dancers could hit a level of quality in 30 seconds that a novice would struggle to match after a month of dedicated focused training on a movement neither of them have ever seen before. I once taught a dance teacher how to snatch from scratch in 20 minutes. Most people take closer to six months to do a decent job. That's the power of motor dance digestion. Interfacing, configuring your positioning and relationship to or with your external environment. There's enormous complexity in how we can interface with objects, people, or the environment we live in. In contact improv, how can I configure myself with another person so that when they lift me, I feel lighter? Or so that I can make all of your movements easier and more accessible? In grappling, if I have you pinned beneath me, how can I configure our connection so that it feels like I weigh a thousand pounds, have grips like hydraulic grappling hooks, and find the configuration that eventually eliminates all of your movement possibilities. If you're climbing, how can you configure yourself so that you can use the tiny protrusions in the rock like a ladder? Balance, the ability to or prediction of keeping weight stable over support points. I truly believe that the single most important rule for movement is that balance is keeping the center of mass above your base of support. There's no sport or discipline in which powerful, expressive, beautiful, or functional movements can be performed without control of your balance. When you understand the simple rule, it's easy to apply it. The base of support is the area bounded by your support points on the floor. Anytime you fall or lose your balance, it's because your center of mass left your base of support or vice versa. So in something like hand balancing, where your base of support is fixed, it's all about rebalancing so that you can keep the center of mass within that fixed base. Or in something like slacklining, where the base of support can move, now you need to find a way to keep the base of support stable under the center of mass. Note that in something like climbing, where you're often hanging, if your center of mass isn't below your anchor points, the same rule applies. Gravity is still there, but it will now create a swing towards your grips rather than a fall away from your support. Balance gets even more interesting when you start working against other people. We can do things like Tai Chi push hands and try to off balance a partner with a fixed base of support. In which case, the opponent is balanced on two feet and the base of support will basically be rectangular with one edge basically the width between their feet and the other edge basically the length of their feet. The physics tells us that the easiest directions to off balance the opponent will be parallel with the plane of the base of support since up and down forces have no fundamental effect on balance and perpendicular to the long edge of that rectangle. Same rule applies when we're grappling or fighting in general, but now the opponent can move their base as you try to off balance them. Now you have to think about their current base of support and their future base of support. So if I push or pull you in any direction, can I move your center of mass farther than you can move your base of support? Generally, you're gonna be much more effective by eliminating their ability to move their base in the direction you're gonna take them. Then all you need is a small little push and gravity will do the rest of the work for you. Orientation, 
awareness of and comfort in the body's positioning relative to the external environment, particularly while in flux and for extended durations. You're probably sitting up or standing right now, and you know exactly where you are, where the floor and ceiling are. But what happens if I put you upside down? Do you still know where the floor is? What if you roll between these two orientations over and over and over again? Will you maintain your awareness of orientation throughout, or are you gonna get vertigo and puke on the floor? The body has various tolerances of rotation in each axis, and they can all be trained. This can be all fun and games, and I love how skill here allows you to accumulate more practice in a variety of rolling or acrobatic elements. But if you've had a serious concussion, it's suddenly not so funny anymore. And if you're working on adding twists to your double backflip, maybe it's a matter of life and death that you know where the floor is, even with such an mm. insane change in orientation. Remember when Simone Biles got the twist these years back and everyone was furious about how she took a few events off? That was exactly this. And I'd love to see any of those keyboard warriors doing a triple twisting double backflip. Musicality, the ability to sense and express the characteristics of music, particularly rhythm through movement and vice versa. Everyone knows someone with no rhythm. We often associate that with footwork and dance, but rhythm can be found everywhere. Can you control the rhythm of a boxing match and break it when and how you choose? When you have a pattern, can you double the rhythm or cut it in half? Can you compartmentalize it and have different parts of the body running different rhythms? There's a more abstract quality to musicality as well. Can you express a song through your movement? Not just the rhythm, but the sentiment and emotionality. This is bi-directional as well. Often certain sounds and vocalizations can be very helpful to the learning and performance of movement. Go to any dance class and you'll hear an assortment of various stuff. It sounds kooky, but there's a good reason for it. It f***ing works. I spent a month training with the Ferris Anime Terra Nova crew this summer in Berlin and then London. And they would often show us a pattern and we'd all struggle with it. And then they'd ask us, who has the song of the movement? And someone would come up with it, a completely novel song that we had never heard, but it captured some essence of the movement we had all seen. And you could tell if it was perfect or even slightly off. And then when we had it right, we'd all use the song while we practiced. And you wouldn't believe how helpful it was. A certain essence of any movement can be captured with sound and finding it will help your performance and learning of the movement itself. Ask anyone who does Muay Thai. Sun, sun. Fine motor control, the ability for detailed control and coordination of small movements and forces. At a biological level, a single motor nerve controls between one and a thousand muscle fibers. Groups of nerves and their corresponding muscle fibers are called motor units. And the coordination and calibration of these smaller motor units are very important as they allow us to produce very nuanced and precise movements. This could be writing, painting, or drawing. It could be archery, spinal rays, rod quality, or shooting free throws. Subtle articulations of the hands, fingers, and toes are all important. You don't want to be that power lifter with clubs for hands. Softness, the ability to dissipate or transmit forces, tension, or impacts. Often, too much muscular engagement can get in the way of what you're actually trying to do. For instance, if I want to throw something, but I keep the muscles of the arm engaged the whole time, that's gonna get in the way of the, the forces I've generated at the feet and the hips. That's one type of softness. Another is with impacts. If I'm falling or rolling, there's a certain type of coordination I can use to soften, if not nearly eliminate the impact when I hit the floor, so that I can do it over and over again comfortably, beautifully, and without injury. Finally, there's another softness that allows you to dissipate forces. If we play Tai Chi push hands and you push me, but I just stay rigid and flex everything, that's actually gonna make it very easy for you to just knock me over. There's a softness you can find that will dissipate that push so that that kinetic energy doesn't get transferred to my center of mass. Same in jujitsu, actually. If I'm passing your guard, if you frame on me and just push me away, if I just tense everything and try to fight you force on force, I'm gonna waste a ton of energy. And if you're even half decent, you're gonna get your guard back. When someone frames on you, there's a certain softness that you can find to dissipate those frames and work around them. People talk about how getting pinned by high level grapplers feels like they're under a wet blanket. You try to push a wet blanket away from you and it's just never gonna work. That's a certain type of softness 
even in a combative setting. Elasticity, the ability to generate lightness, quickness, and reactivity in the body. There's a certain quality that can be found to the body such that it can effectively store and release kinetic energy. When you have this quality, you can use it to balance and create the illusion of lightness as a foundation for extremely quick movements and general athleticism. It's not strength as powerlifters lack it, and it's not weight as I've seen hordes of people no thicker than a fishing pole can somehow manage to walk, run, and dance with the elasticity of a mountain troll. It's at some level a unique axis that I suspect is mostly controlled at a neural level. But some of this also comes at a tissue level. The most common protein in the body is collagen because it provides our cells and connective tissues with structural strength. But elastin is another important structural protein that, you guessed it, provides connective tissues with strength as well as a more elastic quality. And we know as we get older, the ratio of elastin to collagen in our tissues tends to decrease. And this may be one reason why people tend to lose this elastic quality as they get older. A lot of this may have to do with the stretch shortening cycle as well, but we won't get into that much here. Finally, research the ability to refine or generate new movements, particularly with respect to a given function or task. How you approach refining or creating movements or movement tasks is a separate skill from how good you are at doing them. How do you modify a move to work best for you in different environments? How do you work to create new movements or find new connections between old ones? How do you take a move that sucks and make it beautiful and effective? As you can imagine, just like motor digestion, this is an extremely important meta skill and hence, I like to have people start developing it even from day one. Simple example, find as many ways as you can to get to the floor from standing. In every field, there are people who reach an incredible level by copying the exact prescription of those who came before them. And there are those who innovate and create new material. Don't bother reinventing the wheel, but if you're not creating anything new, maybe you should start. These are the 16 axes of movement. It's not meant to be an end-all be-all definition of movement so much as a guideline for important areas of development and movement and a delineation between movement and fitness. Next, we have an exciting announcement. This video has a real sponsor that isn't actually me. Here's the deal. I'm gonna read this next bit in a handstand. We're gonna use the first attempt no matter what. And if I fall, my sponsor segment is over and they're gonna be very upset. But if I stay up, Try not to skip it. Here we go. In 2012, I got really into ketogenic diets. The idea is with minimal carb intake, your body starts to metabolize fats differently and produce ketones, mainly beta-hydroxybutyrate, the HB, which can cross the blood-brain barrier and be used by the brain as fuel. This always seemed like the original evolutionary design of the human body, that when, we, what, that when blood glucose falls, your brain has another fuel source that it can use. In 2014, I first heard about exogenous ketones in the experiment Peter T. did here. Since then, ketone science has improved a lot. Human HVMN uses the third generation of exogenous ketones, 1,3-butanediol or BDO, which gets oxidized to BHB in the liver. Exogenous ketones seem to enhance cognitive performance, save glycogen, reduce blood glucose, and suppress hunger. Ketones also likely ameliorate hypoxic stress, which could be useful for neurodegenerative diseases, and have greater metabolic efficiency than glucose. So I've been using their glutein dial supplement for the last month, and I honestly really like it. It gives me a nice clean energy feeling without actually being a stimulant, and I've been using it when I don't have time for breakfast before training. Now, I say the best time to use it is if you're skipping a meal, or especially before an endurance event, fasting, or starting a ketone diet. However, one, this isn't some sugar slurry. Don't expect it to taste good. Joe Rogan said ketones taste like Godzilla milk. Two, please don't use this to replace meals. It's a supplement, not food. Three, your body should naturally produce ketones, but I wouldn't recommend consuming large amounts regularly long-term. Four, it's acidic, so my mom would kill me if I don't tell you to brush your teeth after having it. See if it feels helpful, don't abuse it, and let me know your honest experience. Use promo code BREN for 20% off, but you have to spell my name right. Back to the movement. <laughs> The next idea is a deambitioning of movement, this idea of being versus becoming. To date, this is one of the most important life lessons I've gotten from the movement practice. So in April 2019, I'm in Thailand at Movement Camp. I'm doing some contact improv tasks with my friend Tanner. By that point, I was already one of the more skilled movers in our group of 40, and Tanner himself is an incredible mover and teacher. 
So we get to partner together and I'm immediately like, oh boy, time to do some cool shit. In contact, it's incredibly rare that you get a partner who's strong, especially a partner who's strong and mobile and an intelligent mover. So I get to partner with Tanner, I'm climbing all over him, I did a handstand on his back, all this fun stuff. And the teacher, Shai Faran, comes over to me and I'll never forget this, she says gently, it seems like you're thinking about what you can do. And I wonder what could happen if you instead focus on working with what's already there. And of course, I'm a skeptical guy. I'm thinking in my head, then how am I going to do all this cool stuff? But nevertheless, I tried it. And I cannot describe to you guys how much more beautiful our work was, how much more immersive and engaging Instead of thinking of something cool and then trying to make it happen, the cool and beautiful things just emerge from what we were doing. Rather than trying to become something, maybe you can allow yourself to simply be. At a functional level, this actually ties back into optimal theory. As you guys remember from this video, optimal theory is all about focus on task goal. Let's remove the word goal for a second. And basically, optimal theory says our performance and learning of a task will increase with anything that will increase our focus on the task and decrease with anything that subtracts from it. Here's the thing, we have limited attentional resources. And actually, thinking about what you could or should be doing while you're doing the task actually detracts from the attention and focus allocated to that task. And hence, your performance and learning of it. So it's this beautiful paradox. If you don't care about the task, you're not gonna do or care about it. So of course your performance will be zero. But if you care too much about the task, you might start thinking about what you wanna do. And any attention you allocate towards what you should or could be doing to perform better during the task will actually make you perform worse and learn slower. So this paradoxical idea of the deambitioning of movement is that if you wanna actually perform your best, you have to actually release your ambition of what you want to do and instead be fully immersed in the task and what's actually there happening around you. But that's just while you're doing a movement. On a wider scale, this starts to touch on the Buddhist philosophy. Attachment is the root of all suffering. So if we can cultivate this emptiness, lack of attachment and ambition, maybe we can live happier, better lives. Or maybe you find yourself in a deep depression because nothing matters anyway and we're all gonna die. In the myth of Sisyphus, the author Albert Camus finds a balance here that I personally really resonate with. He compares what he calls the absurdity of life to Sisyphus, who is cursed to endlessly push a boulder up the mountain only to see it roll down and have to start over and over and over again. Why should we develop our skills, our bodies, our movement, our relationships, our lives when we will ultimately lose everything and die. But Camus concludes that actually, the struggle itself is enough to fill a man's heart. Camus posits that when Sisyphus acknowledges the certainty and futility of his fate, it frees him to reach a state of contented acceptance. And so, we must imagine Sisyphus happy. Personally, I think you still have to have some level of awareness of the output, Otherwise, maybe you're just a mule blindly dragging in whatever carriage you're attached to. But if you start digging a hole with your hands, do you just contentedly accept that it's gonna be a hard and slow process? Or do you go find a shovel? Or can you maintain that contented acceptance state while looking for a shovel? Can we find a true detachment from the hole while maintaining awareness that other tools or methods may make our work more effective? I'd love some productive discussion in the comments here. This is something I think about all the time. Next, we have movement versus movements. In the movement culture and beyond, there's a huge fixation on training certain moves. If you train your bridge, plunge, handstand, flexibility, and deadlift, people might label you a mover. You'll certainly look like one on Instagram. But actually, you haven't truly developed your movement, just a small number of very isolated moves and attributes without the complexity that supplies, supports, and facilitates their use. For example, if you learn how to armbar a jiu-jitsu dummy, you've learned a move. That move in isolation without any of the complexity that allows its application against a real resistant has only developed your overall movement capabilities to a very small degree. 
and in fact, is nearly completely useless. Meanwhile, if you develop your capital M movement grappling ability, maybe you can't post a video of you doing flying arm bars on Instagram, but you are developing the much wider movement capabilities that come along with grappling. Your footwork, explosive force production, interfacing, balance, orientation, cardio, even strength, mobility, and somatics to a small degree. This idea of moves versus movements brings us our third concept, the container and the content. The idea is that individual moves themselves are a container and there's some level of deeper content that they may bring you. For instance, the spinal waves and circle system is a beautiful system designed to help people gain a detailed sensory and kinetic map of where their spine is and how it moves through space. That system of movements is a container and the content is a detailed awareness of your spine. But Ito says all the time, drink the content, don't chew on the cup. Once you've developed a strong foundational awareness for your spine, significant further work on those spinal waves becomes unproductive. You need something more complex and alive to move further, a new container altogether. Rather than getting really good at the spinal waves and never approaching the more general spinal function that was the goal all along. Next, ownership of techniques and Bruce Lee's I hit versus it hits concept. In 2016, I flew to Vegas for a movement intensive with Yuri Marmerstein. We did lots of hand balancing work, some basic acrobatics, and then Yuri brought in an Afro-Brazilian dance teacher to have us do a choreography. At the time, this was one of my first exposures to the world of dance, and pretty much all of the men there, especially me, were terrible. I was holding on for dear life, trying to sip water out of a fire hose, trying to copy the instructor doing these moves I couldn't really comprehend, definitely couldn't replicate or remember. But at the front, I still remember this all like yesterday. There was some magic going on. Three of the girls were catching these moves. By the time we got through the whole choreography, two of the girls were doing the moves as well as the instructor. And I swear to God, one of them was doing them better. So we finished the choreography, and I go up to the girls after and I grilled them. I was so curious. I was like, oh my God, have you guys done this before? And they said, no, they've never done this style of dance before. They've never seen these moves before. I was floored. This is that motor digestion at work and there is a qualitative switch with movements. When you go from needing to watch someone do it, needing to frantically figure out how they coordinated the feet with the hands and which leg was on top, to fucking owning it. As in, I don't need to watch you anymore. This is no longer your move that I'm copying. I have digested yours, and now this is mine. It's not just that you stop watching them and have a badly replicated version of their move. That doesn't count. It's when you've digested and processed the content within the move and that their move only remains relevant as some level of a blueprint for yours. Like if they've handed you a sketch and you filled that sketch with your own painting, with your body and your style, your strengths and your weaknesses all rolled into it. And then there's a deeper level of ownership that Huberman romanticizes as virtuosity. I think the way it's been described to me is that we go from unskilled to skilled and then there's mastery, and then there's this top tier, which is this beautiful thin layer that so few people occupy, which is virtuosity, in which the practitioner invites variability and chants back in as an opportunity to do truly new things. I see it a bit differently. I feel this way about the fisherman I showed you in the intro to movement part three. I fucking own that move. I can do it forwards, backwards, sideways, traveling, spinning, sliding on grass, concrete, or a dance floor in socks, shoes, barefoot. You name the conditions, give me five minutes and I'll have a great time finding all the different ways you could apply the fisherman to that task. In a way, these are all different movements, but when you really own the content of the move, you can repurpose that into any different container, movement, or task that you want and you never really own the content until you have seen and absorbed that content from many different containers. For instance, if you do house dance, it's pretty incredibly demanding of footwork, but you don't really own footwork, you own house dance footwork. And it's not until you understand footwork and say house dance and team sports and boxing and grappling and all the dramatically different utilization of footwork within those disciplines that you start to understand what footwork itself really is outside of the specific containers you've been exposed to. Now, back to Bruce Lee's It Hits. I would say most people have reasonable ownership over walking forwards and straight lines. 
Walking itself is an incredibly complex movement. So if I were to list off the sequence of even gross muscle and joint actions that you have to take just to walk and tell you to perform them in sequence, it would cripple your ability to walk well. Optimal theory strikes again. Those internal focus cues, or even just thinking about what your body is doing or needs to do to walk, removes your focus on the task and hence decreases your performance in learning. So instead of forcing yourself to shift weight, extend the knee, ankle, lift foot, place foot on the floor, etc., in a manner of speaking, you simply allow the walk to happen. So when Bruce Lee says, I do not hit, it hits all by itself, this is what he means. When you own a technique, you don't need or have to force it to happen. You can simply allow your body to do it. And by doing this, you'll actually do a better job. Finally, what are movement sleeves? This is a concept that Ido taught at Movement Camp in 2019. And it's a powerful one that I use and refer to often. Remember the fisherman example that I gave from earlier where I said I could do it, quote, forwards, backwards, sideways, traveling, spinning, sliding on grass, concrete, and on a dance floor in socks, shoes, or barefoot? These are all different movement patterns. Even doing the fisherman on concrete versus floor can really change what you can do or not do. But we can fit them all within the wider scope of something we call a movement sleeve which is a wider concept of not the specific movement pattern, but the general concept of what makes any variation of the fisherman still a fisherman. In this video, we worked with conditioning the entire movement sleeve of the squat. No matter how we had our feet placed on the floor, what the partner put in our way, or even if they lifted one of our legs, we could still do some version of a squat, something that fits within that movement sleeve of a squat. That's the movement sleeve. Final disclaimer, I'm not Ido. I'm not claiming to be presenting any of his ideas. Rather, this is my interpretation based on years I've spent teaching, studying the work and the science itself, and with him and many other movement teachers. If you really wanna hear Ido's ideas from Ido's perspective, don't bother with me, listen to Ido. If you wanna hear more from my perspective, check out my intro to movement series here, our channel memberships, or come train with me in San Francisco. Have a great day.